as I said earlier, this morning we're going to be starting in the book of Jude. And um, several months ago, whenever we were in the books of 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, I was trying to figure out where I wanted to go next and, and looking at my, at my sermon calendar and trying to figure all that out. <clears throat> uh, it was just kind of natural for us to go from 1 John, 2 John, 3 John right into the book of Jude. And so today we're going to begin in this wonderful, uh, wonderful little book that is just rich of all kinds of theology. And I'm going to read the first three verses uh, today, <clears throat> but I'm not going to make it through the first three verses today. Uh, I might make it through the first word today, um, but let's see. Here we go. Jude, uh, this is verses 1, 2, and 3. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. To those who are called, believed in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. <clears throat> Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about your common salvation, our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So the first thing that I want us to, to kind of um, capture again <clears throat> is it's, it's all about the truth. Everything that we live, eat, and breathe, every, every way that we respond to life, whatever life throws out at us, is governed, we should be living by, walking by, loving by the truth as it is presented in God's Word. And that's, that's what this ministry is all about. That's what this church is all about. That's what this church family is all about. Um, without the truth then we might as well just show up and have some hot dogs and you know a little bag of chips and go home. Because it's not going to do much good in the community. It's not going to do much good in preparing us for life. And how many of you know that life can throw some really horrible things at you? Right? It can. And it's the truth of God's Word that prepares us for that. Um, God has exalted His truth as high as His name. He is the God of truth. He identifies Himself that way. I know that Jesus Christ is the glory of God in human flesh that came uh, as the God-man, and according to John, is full of truth. The Bible tells us He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man will ever know the Father unless they go through Jesus Christ. And I know that Jesus said that truth would set the sinner free. And we certainly believe that. We, 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 we stake our very existence on that. The Bible is called the Word of Truth. And Jesus said that your Word is truth. Um... We are to worship God in truth. We are to obey the truth, to love the truth, to judge by the truth, to speak the truth in love toward one another, to walk in the truth. And as we learned in John's epistles, uh, to love in the truth. So you see that everything about us, everything about our existence, is wrapped up in truth. That's why the church, you people, are called the pillar and support of the truth. It is up to us to uphold the truth, to spread the truth. Uh, and as much as possible, um, as we try to live the truth, show the community around us what this truth is all about. 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, at the end of that letter, John writes, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. 
And we are in Him who is true in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. And then in 2 John, we find, uh, remember the very first verse, the elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. And then you go down to verse 4 in 2 John, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth. And when we come to 3 John, it starts the same way, doesn't it? It starts, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. And then down to verse 3 in 3 John, I was very glad when brethren came and bore witness to your truth. That is how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. So there are three great letters from John that are all centered on truth. They're all about truth. And it's essential. Think about it. It's essential to our justification. It's essential to our, to our salvation and sanctification and, 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 and um, our hope of glorification. The truth, living by the truth, is essential to us as Christians. Our whole relationship with God is, is hinged on the truth. So, if the truth is that important, my second point is the truth is under attack. As a result of it being so important, we have said so many times in John's epistle and others, other areas that we've preached through so far, that there's, there is a movement has been a movement against the truth. Since the fall of Adam and Eve, uh, God has been revealing His truth, His saving truth. You remember, early on in the book of Genesis, and, and again, I'm not going to go from Genesis to, well, I am kind of going to go from Genesis to Revelation. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> I just thought about it. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to roll my sleeves up. Here we go. Um, Early on in the book of Genesis, whenever God revealed the Savior to come, He was revealing the truth that would uh, smash the head of the serpent. And, and you roll forward and you see that at every turn, um, like with uh, Cain, Satan has done whatever he could do to destroy the truth. I mean, he's used, he's used demons, he's used people, um, he's used people who were full of demons <laughs> to do whatever he could do to stop the truth. But God has prevailed. And we have His Word that reveals to us the truth. Along the way, unfortunately, and if you know much about church history, you... You can, you can go back and look. Along the way, there have been those who have proclaimed to know the truth, who have said, you know, I'm a Christian, or I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. They've seen a lot of people who have uh, claimed to walk the walk, who have abandoned the truth. For whatever reason, they have defected and that's sad and so whenever this defection happens um, we call that apostasy it's a defection away from the truth and so one thing that we have to be very very careful of and you can also see this in church history is this that over time over the centuries of the existence of the church, the most damage has not been from the outside. The most damage in the church has come from within. And who does it come from? It comes from these apostate people who were claiming to be part of the family who then began to defect and are not. 
And that's sad. But it's very real. It's very, very real. And Jude is very concerned about this. And what we're going to find is, is that Jude is, is going to bring forward, is going to flush out these defectors, these apostates. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-5 through five talk about every kind of speculation, every kind of ideology, every kind of theology, every kind of religion, every philosophy, every viewpoint that you can imagine and how it is so damning to the truth. But again, the most egregious, the most formidable attack on the truth comes from inside. In verse 3 in this epistle, I just read to you a while ago, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So this indicates to us that, that maybe Jude sat down to write a really positive letter. A letter about common salvation that, that we all participate in, that we all share. But then, the Holy Spirit, speaking to Jude, and, and Jude was inspired by the Holy Spirit, so this was, this was an infusion of the Holy Spirit in, in Jude's heart. Jude said, I found it necessary to write to you about contending for the faith. So to contend means um, to agonize, to, to, to fight, to struggle, to battle, to give great effort, to have a great amount of exertion, to contend for the faith, to protect the truth. And so Jude is basically saying, you know, I had some things to write to you, but right in the beginning, whenever I started writing, the Holy Spirit moved me to write about protecting the truth. So you had the three epistles of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, toward the end of your Bible, the back of your Bible. And then at the very back of your Bible, you have the book of Revelation, and, and so, so here's something that's interesting. You have 1 John written by John, 2 John written by John, 3 John written by John, Revelation written by John, and then right in the middle you have this book written by this guy named Jude. And so, you know, it's, it's a relatively small book, uh, it's the fourth smallest book in the Bible. You have 2 John, 3 John, and Philemon are smaller than the book of Jude. So 25 verses you have. It's the last of the eight general epistles written by Peter and John and James and Jude in the New Testament. And, and why, why did the Holy Spirit dump Jude in between John's writings? Well... The book of Revelation is, is a phenomenal book. But when you get through the book of Revelation, you think, this is it. This is the end. And whenever you, you, you see the crazy things that are going on in this day and time, the one thing that keeps coming back to my mind is this. I read the end of the book. I know how this is going to end. Now, I, I'm not going to do a prophecy update. I, I'm not going to take a bunch of time, but um, this week I found out some very interesting news from a man that I really put a lot of, of faith and trust in. And it's his belief... Uh, do I really want to go there? It's his belief that this thing with Ukraine 
is not going to be good for Ukraine. It's his belief that things are wrapping up pretty quickly. And that we're going to see an alliance of nations coming together, led by, the Bible says, Rosh, Russia, in conjunction with a couple of others, and their sole purpose in this alliance is going to be Ezekiel 38, attack Israel. Now, I said all that to say this. I read the end of the book. We're not going to be here. You know, God is going to send His Son in the clouds to snatch us up. And He's going to snatch us up so fast, I hope I get a creak in my neck. <laughs> That's how fast I want to go. Poof! And I'm gone. And I'll say hi, y'all, on the way up. And so that's the book of Revelation. And so just before the book of Revelation, we have this little book called Jude. Now, the book of Jude is, is about the end of the church age. You have, you have the Acts of the Apostles that was the beginning of the church age. It, it tells us all kinds of things about how the church was formed and what all was going on as this church was formed and this family of believers were there in Jerusalem. Bunches of folks decided to stay in Jerusalem. They had no place to go, but the church was formed and took care of them. Amazingly. And then you come over to Jude, and you have the end of the church age. So we have 1 John, 2 John, 3 John that points us to the truth. We have the book of Revelation that tells us about what's going to happen at the end and right before the book of Revelation, we have the book of Jude that wraps up the church age. But it says this, and we're going we're gonna to get into this, not today, but starting next Sunday. I promise I'll get into it. Jude is telling us, before the end comes, before Jesus comes back to take up his church, these apostate people, this apostasy, this, this um, uh, trying to tear up the church, trying to destroy the truth, is just going to continue to escalate and escalate and escalate and escalate and escalate. In other words, it's going to get pretty, pretty rough. And might even get to the place, fairly quickly, that if you're standing for the truth, it may be... A difficult life for you. Now, if, if that happens and people start coming to your house, just come on to my house. Uh, you know, I've got a creek right next to the house, and and we can we can dig up some of Houston's old garden and plant some stuff. I've got seeds, and when we can make it, we can have church in the tobacco barn. It'll be good. But I'm thinking that it's going to get really, really rough. Really rough. Second Peter tells us a lot about this. Second Thessalonians tells us a lot about this. Um, Paul even calls it the apostasia. That means the apostasy. The apostasy. The, the great apostasy. And you can... You can just pretty much put your money on it that moral character is going to decline very quickly. Very, very quickly. We're warned about false teachers and, and apostates that will come and enter the church trying to do harm. 1 John chapter 4 says, Do not believe every spirit. Test the spirits to see whether they're from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 2 John verse 7 says, Many deceivers have gone out into the world and who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves. And of course, in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3 is about these seven churches. Five out of the seven churches have basically defected. Only two of these churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, have remained faithful. And we know that this was a hotbed of of uh, 
the church, this, 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 this um, Asia Minor uh, effort from Paul to go and plant these churches, it, it was phenomenal. All of the churches that were planted there, and they began to defect. And we see that at the, at the end time, uh, only five have defected. The other two have remained faithful. So what does that tell us about the end times? It tells us that, that it's going to be a difficult time and that there are going to be people who come into the church who are going to work very hard to try to destroy the truth. And we have to be aware of those people. That's where Jude is going to take us. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 um, is talking about the apostasy, the falling away, and it occurs before the Antichrist steps out onto the scene during the time of tribulation. And, and let, me, let me just say that, that the rapture of the church does not trigger the tribulation. A lot of people have that timeline in their minds. Uh, the rapture of the church is before the tribulation begins. What triggers the tribulation is the seven-year covenant made with Israel. That's what triggers the tribulation. We won't be here for that. And Peter has said in uh, 2 Peter, false teachers are going to come and they're going to bring in all kinds of heresies. We just covered First and Second Peter in, in Bible study and the one thing that's stuck in my mind is heresy is not good. It is not good. And so we have this. We have Jesus who said, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. We have Paul who said, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. We have Peter who said, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. They all say, it's coming. And where does Jude fit in? Jude said, it's not coming no more. It's here. It's here. And so we're going to have to contend with it. Jude says, uh, my fourth point is this, Jude says, get ready, get ready, get ready. Get ready. I want to tell you, you need to contend for the faith. This thing is going to wrap up. The rapture is going to happen and jerk all the Christian folk up out of here. Jude 1 and one says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to those who are called beloved. So, okay, I guess I better get into the sermon now. <laughs> it's getting, getting late in the morning. So let's look at that first word, Jude. Jude. The Hebrew for this word, Jude, is Judah. The Greek for this word Jude, get this, is Judas. And that kind of freaks me out a little bit. You know, how many people do you know whose name is Judas? You know, whew, I'd, hate for, I'd hate for mom and dad to be getting on to me, my name being Judas. That would be horrible. And so there are several people in the Bible whose name was Judas. There were two apostles. There was Judas Iscariot and Judas not Iscariot um, in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 9, there was Judas of Damascus. Um, in Acts 15, there was Judas Barsabas. And um, uh, Judas not Iscariot had a couple of other names, one of which you probably have heard was Thaddeus, called Thaddeus. Now, who is, who is this Jude? Who is this Judas that we're reading about? Well, Jude says that he's the brother of James. Brother of James. Well, who is James? James is the half-brother of Jesus. The half-brother of Jesus. Of course, Joseph, Joseph and Mary were the mother and father of, of all the half-brothers. Mary is the mother, the virgin mother of Jesus, and so that's why they're half-brothers. But if you look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, it says that Mary was the mother of Jesus, and his brothers' names were James and Joseph, and Simon and Judas. James and Joseph, Simon and Judas. So, 
we know that this Judas that we're going to read about was the brother of James, and he must be the half-brother of Jesus. Now, this is, this is wonderful. This is fabulous, if you stop to think about it. Because uh, if you remember back in John chapter 7, we're told that his brothers, Jesus' Jesus's brothers didn't believe him. <laughs> I find that extremely interesting, knowing that Jesus uh, started his ministry whenever he was you know, around 30. So for 30 years, he had been around these brothers, and they didn't believe that he was Jesus. And Jesus was without sin. The, the brothers were not without sin, but yet they saw him live out his life, and yet they didn't believe him until they witnessed the resurrected Savior. Then they believed him. And that's amazing that, that after they came into this, this belief system that Jesus was who he said he was, the Holy Spirit inspired two of his brothers to write New Testament books, James and Jude. Spirit inspired. So again, the wonderful grace of God reaches down on these brothers and... and uh, write these amazing books, all because they witnessed the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. So Jude views Jesus Christ not in a, not in a familial way, like you know family. Um, he, he views his brothers that way, and he says, I'm a brother of James. Well, why didn't he, why didn't he say that I'm a half-brother of Jesus because Jesus is a divine being after the resurrection. He's no longer walking around like he did before his death. James and Jude become followers of Jesus. And so now, Jesus is his Lord and Savior. And that's why he points to James and says, I'm a brother of James. That's amazing. And so Jude is going to write about the escalating apostasy that we're going to get into and see in the coming days. It's really important, I think, for us to put bookends this morning on this, on this little bit of an overview of the book of Jude uh, because it's, it's going to paint a picture for us of where we're going to go. Um, if you look at the book of Jude, and, and I would encourage you this week to read through it. it it's a very quick read you'll see some familiar things. Um, next week we'll cover verse 1 and 2, which are very, very important to all of this. And, and here's why. Um, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Uh, let me point to a couple of these words. To those who are called to those who are beloved, to those who are kept. And what emphasis would you put on those words? Where would you, where would you kind of categorize the meaning of these words? Called, beloved, kept. It can be summed up in one word. Security. Security. We are as Christians, as fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ, somewhat protected in our ministry. And so Jude begins this book by saying, look, um, I'm going to point out these apostates. I'm going to point out what this war is all about. And you can go to battle. You can go to war to continue 
contend for the faith, to protect the faith. Why? Because you're protected. And so he's going to call us to do just that, to protect the faith. And, and, and then he's, he ends this epistle. Uh, over in verse 24, he says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, he will make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. You know, anytime anybody goes to war, there's always the thought of becoming a casualty. You know, we, we have that all around us. We, we see young men getting deployed all the time. And, and it's always in the back, especially of their family's mind, that they, they could get hurt. Jude says, You don't have to worry about that. God has this taken care of. Now, I'm not talking about that kind of war. I'm talking about this battle that we're, that we're up against, the, the battle of protecting the truth. And so, God is going to take care of you as you contend for the faith. As you protect the truth, He's going to take care of you. And here's the long and the short of it. Eventually, He's going to take care of you to the point that if He tarries, He's going to bring you home. Now, I know if you were a young person, you're like, yeah, 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 okay, I, I know, I heard about that. And, 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 and I believe in Jesus. But I don't want to go on the next bus load. You just leave me around for a little while. And I, I find it interesting that whenever I do a, a, a wedding, one of the things that I want to lean over and say to the groom is, wouldn't it be great if Jesus came back right now? <laughs> That's mean, isn't it? I, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say that. But, all of that to say this, we're going to wind up one way or the other in heaven forever with Jesus Christ. And I wish you could have been here if you weren't. I wish you could have been here when we went through uh, the series on heaven. Heaven is not like anything that we can ever imagine. The, the, the colors are going to be so much more brilliant. Uh, life is going to be wide open is what I say. And there are those that will be there forever and ever and ever and ever and ever that you love. The Bible says we will be known as we are known. And so just as soon as you split those pearly gates wide open, guess what? People are going to be there who know you. The greatest thing, though, is that we'll see Jesus. He's the one that made it all possible. And I love him dearly for the sacrifice that he made for me. What a wonderful, wonderful Savior he is. So, we can fight in this battle. We don't have to worry about being a casualty because Jesus has us covered. Let's bow our heads and we'll close. Father God, thank you for this truth today. Thank you for opening our eyes to this word from the book of Jude. I pray, Father God, that you will prepare our hearts, that we will learn to recognize what's going to happen in the, in the days ahead. I pray that you would help us, Father God, to, to understand the message that you inspired through Jude. And then I pray that you would prepare us to understand the end times. Oh, Father God, we just, we love you so much. You are, 
You are righteous and you are holy. And you love us more than we know, more than we can ever understand you love us. And I pray in the days to come that you would just show us, Father. More and more, let, let us see your great and mighty hand in our lives that we may more and more appreciate your great love for us. We pray these things this day in the name of Jesus Christ, our precious Lord and Savior. Amen.